All right, team, good evening. Did everyone grab a handout that wanted one? Paul, you're just going to look on Brenda's? Cheat okay. off our notes. Cheater. Yeah. It's pretty typical. That's right. All right, let's pray, and then we will jump in. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this evening. We thank you for your goodness to us, uh, for your mercy. And as we've walked through... Um, this incredible study and taking deep dives into uh, aspects of the gospel, um, that you are the gospel. The gospel is, is the, um, is the uh, unfolding of your character and your deep desires um, that you've given your son for us uh, because you would rather be glorified by your mercy um, than your wrath. Uh, we praise you for that. Help us this evening. Uh, to study and to think well, uh, and to be transformed, um, to apply this to our lives um, in our view of you, in our view of our circumstances. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right. So we did not get through everything last week. We got stuck in the book of Ruth which is not a bad place to, to get stuck for, uh, for a while. Uh, lot uh, that we covered there, but as we thought through what it means to be redeemed, um, what, what stood out to you from last week or maybe what since last Wednesday, anybody uh, bold or brave enough to share like, hey, what, what's going on in your head after we really looked at redemption that just struck you about the Lord, about what it means that we're redeemed? Anybody? Have any profound thoughts or? Does know. anybody remember last week? Yeah. <laughs> was anybody here last week? Um, <laughs> that's a whole new group that you're like, what was last week? I wasn't here. It was a long time ago. It was. <laughs> it's like being out of slavery. I wasn't here, but I'm just guessing. Yeah, well, you got it. That's right. What does redeem mean? Let's just start there. Let's go back to square one from last week. Yeah, to, yeah, to be bought. You had to buy back, right? To to purchase out of. That's good. Did you? And when we looked at the book of Ruth last week, um, what were we? What did we see there um, in the book of Ruth about redemption? This is an incredible redemption story. Anybody remember? Yeah, yeah. She was the closest Right, yeah, we're introduced to Boaz, who is the, a kinsman redeemer, right? And so that idea that uh, Ruth and her mother-in-law, Naomi, are... They're helpless. Uh, they, they have no way to provide for themselves. Um, they, they are a step away from being in slavery, right? Having to go be a servant to someone else just to survive. And here is Boaz, uh, who is a kinsman redeemer. He has the ability to rescue them, to redeem them out of that situation. Um, he is... He meets all the criteria, and he's willing to step in uh, and and to redeem um, Ruth uh, and and her mother-in-law uh, Naomi. And then we see how God, uh, and then we see like this story of redemption that comes out of Ruth's story of redemption. Amen. Like Ruth is the grandmother of of who. King David, right? King David uh, comes from this redemption story of, uh, in, in the book of Ruth between Ruth and Boaz. And like even these pictures, we, we spent a lot of time last week looking at this picture uh, where Ruth says to Boaz, you know, spread your wings over me uh, for you are a redeemer. You remember that last week? What did we bring out? Uh, and Pastor Jason was our, our visual last week. 
Yeah, we brought out the prayer shawl, didn't we? And, and just this, the prayer shawl, this picture, like it had wings. Like when you would wear the prayer shawl, um, the, the ends, when it would be held out, it was, it was this idea of wings. And that's where the word comes from. And so this idea, we saw that it, it, it comes up in scripture over and over where it talks about how the Lord's wings uh, cover us. We see Jesus using that language of like there is healing in the wings of our redeemer and he protects us. There's refuge in his wings. There's redemption uh, in his wings. There's this covering, this blessing. Uh, And so we see that imagery in Ruth, but it's meant to point us to see uh, that there is a redeemer that truly can rescue us. Um, from the power of sin, the, the bondage of sin. Uh, and so, so we just kind of explored that in, in, some, in some really great ways. I would encourage you, uh, if you weren't here last week, to, to go back and read some of what's in the handout because we're going to pick up really on page 59 uh, tonight. But go back and look at that. Go back and watch the recording from last week that's online and you can kind of pick up on some of what we covered in Ruth. Uh, Because tonight we're going to transition and look at some scriptures in the New Testament that talk about redemption. And then we're going to look at reconciliation and what what scripture has to say there. Two things very much tied tied in together. Anything you want to add before we jump in? All right. So before we go to the passages of scripture that we have here looking at the riches of redemption... In the New Testament, I want to read you something out of just an incredible devotional uh, that we use a lot around here just because it is so rich in gospel truth uh, and how it applies to our life. It's called New Morning Mercies. Uh, it's by Paul David Tripp is, is the author. But in the devotion for uh, October 23rd, so it just so happens to be today's, here, listen to what he says here. He said, there is simply no panic in heaven. God is never anxious. There's no confusion in the Trinity. God never wrings his hand and wishes that he had made a better choice. God never worries about what is going to happen next or stresses over how things are going to turn out. God is never surprised or caught up short. He is never in a situation that overwhelms him. God never feels needy or unprepared. God never regrets that he did not do better. God never fails at a task. He never makes promises that he cannot keep. He never forgets what he said or what he wants to do next. God never contradicts himself or fails to be exactly who he said he was. He is all powerful, absolutely perfect in every way, faithful to every word, sovereign over all that is. He is the definition of love, He is righteous, just, tender, and patient all at the same time. He is not dismayed or distracted by our panic and our questions. No, the sovereign move of his grace marches on. That sounds like all of us, right? Doesn't that that describe you, right? That you're never overwhelmed, you never feel needy or unprepared, you never contradict yourself, right? That's, That's all of us, right? Can you... That's none of us. It is you, Paul. Yeah, that that describes Paul here. Um, You know, but listen to this. So God is not discouraged in the face of our weakness and wondering. Amen. His plan is not thwarted when our, by our spiritual vacillation. He doesn't look at us and ask whether it's worth it. Amen. No, in the face of our ongoing struggles, his plan marches on. Why? It marches on because this is so good. It is not based on our character, but on his. That kind of summarizes this entire study that we're doing, looking at the gospel. Everything we have seen, justification, atonement, Um, now looking at redemption and and reconciliation, all of this is rooted in his character. Amen? 
redemption, which is what we're talking about tonight, does not rest on our resolve, but on his. Salvation doesn't hang on our strength, but on his. We have hope because it all comes from him and rests on him. It is humbling to admit, but it is the only place of hope. I think that is the that is the difficult thing when we sit and we think about these incredible truths of the gospel, but it's the most freeing thing as well when we realize there is absolutely nothing we can do to save ourselves, to earn it, right? But then when we recognize, but God has done it all and it is his character uh, that, <laughs> that has accomplished it. It's based on him and not us. Nothing in our salvation, he says, depends on us. It all rests on his sovereign grace. So here is the bottom line. He is able, he is willing, and he is faithful. His grace supplies everything we need and his grace will win. Isn't that good? Right, so when we think about, like why would we be studying these things, right? These truths and really digging into God's word to, to see these things. It's for that reason right there so that we can apply them to our lives, to everyday real situations. We can understand that, that, that his grace, right? It is, it is a gift that is based in his character, not our efforts and our works, um, that this plan of God to redeem is, is something that he will accomplish because of who he is, not because of who we are. That is a freeing thing, isn't it? Can't that impact how you, how you live when you, when you remind yourselves of those truths? Like, just think with me for a minute. When you understand these things that we just read or some of the things we've been thinking about over this, this semester, right? being set free to understand you are justified, you are declared righteous, right? That you have, you are a recipient of God's mercy and you're a recipient of his grace. Your sin has been atoned for. It has been paid in full by someone else. Like, how does that change the way you see things around you every day? Okay. There's a humility. What else? It's hopeful. Other things? Danny, why does it give you hope? Because of his love. A love that you, uh, it's just hard to comprehend. And so you just want to do better each and every day and spread his work. That's good. gives you peace, if you couldn't hear that, knowing that he is in control. Is that something we all need every day? Amen, right? I mean, how about the way you interact with other people? How does knowing that you are a recipient of his grace and he has lavished his mercy on you, just to use that example, how does that change how you interact with someone else? Okay, so how would we do that then um, with that, just with that one truth that we... You share it with others. What you know, that's part of the Christian faith is to share it with others. Amen. What you have received. Amen. Be more loving and less judgmental. Yeah, when you, when you know that you have received grace. Yes, ma'am. That you are more willing to show grace when you understand uh, the grace that you have received, right? You're, you're less judgmental. Uh, uh. Another way I look at it is if, uh, <clears throat> if God has filled you up, then you have something to give. Otherwise, we, we end up in so many of our relationships uh, looking to take 
Okay, so when, when Daniel or I sit down for marriage counseling, right, and it's gotten to the spot where it's bad enough that they've come to us, okay, uh, what do you think the number one issue is, just in, in a large category? Okay, c- communication, yes, but even underneath the communication problems, what do you think kind of one of the, almost the main root is? Yeah, yeah, it's a, it's a selfishness. It's a, um, I'm not getting anything out of this. We used to like each other, but I don't that much anymore, and I'm not getting that much from her, or she's not getting that much from him. That's that sort of deal. And uh, what Scripture always points you to, right, in that relationship um, uh, is, is, well, you're called to be a servant. But the reality is you can't be a servant unless you get filled up from God, right? That's the foundation. The reason uh, we, we go through an entire semester of drilling deep into the well of the gospel is because uh, you got to fill up, right? Christ fills you up and then you overflow to the people around you. And so when we talk about these deep truths, right, and we say words like, he gives me peace, I have hope for the future, right? If you package all that together, you, you say something like, he fills my cup and it overflows. Amen. Amen. And we're going to see, that's how we're actually going to wrap up tonight is actually as we look at reconciliation. I want us to spend some more time uh, at the end tonight thinking of of a charge that Paul gives us in Corinthians uh, about like what the gospel should produce in us, like the charge it gives us as followers of Jesus. So we're going to get there in just a few minutes. But before we do, let's jump in. And I want you to look at some scriptures with me. You've got them there on page 59 of your handout. But we could have pulled up lots of different passages, but these um, six that you have in front of you here, we're going to look at these. And I want you to help, help me as we read them. Tell me like where you see the riches of redemption in, in, these, in these passages here. Like, what does it say about redemption that is just showing you what God has done and, and, and the beauty of it? So, in him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace. What is the beautiful thing that Paul reminds us of here in, in Ephesians 1 about redemption? What does it what does it do in our lives? Yeah, it forgives us of our trespasses. Yeah, um, so underline forgiveness right. there. Yeah, so what are the, like when you think about like, what is, such, what is the big deal about redemption that we've been purchased, our, we've been rescued uh, from, from the state being enslaved to sin, right? Well, we have been, we have been forgiven of, of trespasses, willful wrongdoing, right? Not just accidental wrongdoing where it's like, whoops, we, you know, we didn't mean to do that. That was kind of an accident. No, like these, these trespasses, this is, this is intentional. Like I knew it was wrong and I did it anyway. Um, and redemption says that through what Christ has done, Through the riches of his grace, he has forgiven us of our trespasses. Amen? How about this one? For it is because of one man's trespass, death reigned through that one man. Much more will those who receive the abundance of grace and the free gift of righteousness reign in life through the one man, Jesus Christ. When you read that and you think, I've been redeemed, what does that now say about who you are? Yeah. 
Yes. That's right. Underline that. That's right. Free gift of righteousness. So what does that mean in your mind? What is the free gift of righteousness? Someone explain that and as if I'm 10 years old. Go ahead. Okay. Yeah, she said when we stand before Christ, we have Christ's righteousness. Right? So, so think of a, a, a great picture of like Christ's goodness, his perfection, all of his right doings as a white garment that he takes and covers you with. And that covering, not only are you completely forgiven of all that you've previously done, but now you are covered in his goodness, in all of his perfection, okay? That's, what it, that's this free gift, the gift of righteousness. Remember when we, yes, ma'am. That's great. Mm -hmm. I like, did y'all hear that? Yeah, so if, if I have been, if I have the free gift of righteousness, I now have Jesus's report card instead of my own, right? So for you, you know, C minus students in the room, Paul. Um, oh, I'm sorry, I, I'm sorry. Uh, <laughs> You cheat off of other people's papers for your, so you may have the A report card. But yes, the A++ report card, right? Like you, the perfect, when the one you held previously was failing. Mm -hmm. Every grade, every subject, fail, 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 right? But then, and you know it, and you know that's what you're going home with, but then what you're handed is the one that says A plus, 100%. That's a great way to, to understand that we have received the free gift of righteousness. We didn't earn it. It was a gift. Amen. That's great. Good. Okay, another one. You guys are doing good. Galatians 3, verse 13. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, cursed is everyone who's hanged on a tree. What is the glorious thing about being redeemed here? It's good. Yeah, so what we would ask, what is the curse of the law? Death. Yeah, death. But I want you to expound on that a little more. Okay, so uh, what, what, what occurs in hell? Eternal separation, separation from God. Eternal separation from God, but what in addition to that? Burning fire Yeah, so there's a lot of uh, metaphorical and horrific language about what you're going to feel, but what are you specifically punished for? Yeah, you're punished for your sins, right? So in the report card analogy, you're coming home with an F. Your parents are going to be really upset. You know you're going to be grounded. There's going to be consequences for it, right? That is the curse of the law. The curse of the law is death, and, and the implication and unfolding of that is the consequence for sinning, the punishment of sinning. That is what Jesus has become, Right? That is what he became. He was cursed for you on your behalf. So when we, when we unpack forgiveness, right, that first one is forgiveness. This is a deeper aspect of it because you have to remember you were cursed for your sin. But that is gone. That's what the forgiveness means, that that curse of sin is gone. That's right. That's good. So the law in and of itself, is the law bad? Like when we think like we, the word curse, right? It's not a good thing, right? It's, it's bad. So is the law bad? 
No, there's nothing wrong with the law. The law, Scripture tells us, Paul tells us the law is, is a schoolmaster that shows us our need for, for a Savior, right? Because the law is not the curse. The curse is that we can't keep God's law, right? So Christ did it for us, but then took that curse upon himself. Um, glorious when we think about all that redemption means and the way scripture wants to define it. And you see all these different ways that it, it's defining it. Like, oh, redemption's all about forgiveness and, and redemption is about being clothed in his righteousness. And redemption is all about being rescued from the curse that we were under. Let's look at another one, Titus chapter two who gave himself, talking about Jesus, for us to redeem us from all lawlessness and to purify for himself a people for his own possession who were zealous for good works. Powerful verse of scripture. What do you see here? Truth about redemption in this verse. What are we being redeemed from? Yeah, we're being redeemed from lawlessness and we're being what? R redeemed to what? Yeah, purified. Um, so if we're thinking, if we're, if we're thinking this way, right? Like we were lawbreakers and we've been redeemed from that. We weren't even able to keep the law, right? Like we, we, were, we were lawbreakers. Christ has saved us from being that and he has now purified us. There is a cleansing that he has done through his shed blood. He has purified us, but he didn't just purify us so that we can stand here and say, I've been purified. What does it say that, why has he purified us? Now, what's the two? To purify us, what for? Yeah, for yeah. himself. For himself, as his own possession, so that he could call us his own. Do you pause? And I'm, I'm asking this to myself too, because I think the answer for me is no, I don't. But let me ask you, maybe you guys are better about this than me. Do you pause long enough to think about, I belong to the Father, like I am His possession. Like, I mean, isn't that amazing? Just to stop and think. Is there a security in that as a believer to know that you belong to him when you understand just his character uh, his, and, you, and then you read passages like this, like he has purified you so that you can belong to him. And I love the way this ends. You belong to him, but he takes you from, right, your your old purpose, your old identity is a lawless rule breaker, right? If we were to look at some of the other passages, right? Who was cursed. Um, and now what is it? Like, what are you, who, what are you now? What is, how does the verse end? Yeah, you've got a new nature, right? You are now zealous for, for good works. Like you have an ability because you have been redeemed that you did not have before. Right? You have the ability to, to do good works, to honor God, to glorify him with what you do. So Daniel, you asked a good question. Do, do we pause often enough and ask ourselves or preach the gospel to ourselves and say, I am his, I am his possession. 
Uh, what, what about those times when, when we don't particularly feel very purified or very zealous for good works? What, what, do, you, what do you guys think we do in those times? Yeah, so, so tell me literally how you do that given, uh, given we don't feel very purified in the moment and we don't feel like a child of God um, and uh, uh, cert- certainly uh, when we sin or when we're ha- in discouragement, uh, the enemy sure attacks us uh, uh, and reminds us of our sin and says things like, uh, Danny, you don't look like a child of God. <laughs> so, what 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 do, what do we say in those moments? Yeah. Because of the redemption, right? The, the reality is, is I was never worthy. When he found me, I was dead in my sin. He has redeemed me. He has purified me. And if he could do it when I was all the way filthy, right, then, then he can continue to do it even now in, as I struggle to walk forward, right? You, you say that. I was never worthy, but he has made me worthy. You use words like this. He's redeemed me. And when he purchased me, I was all the way dead. So he still purchased me. That's the good news, right? He still calls me his own, right? That's, that's why I press this because, guys, this is, re- this is real life, okay? You, you, you have to take it from, yeah, I remember when we sat there and we were all around the circle and we were like, yeah, you, sh- you should tell yourself more often, I'm, I'm God's child. Well, the reality is we don't always feel that. But this is the gospel. I don't care how you feel, Martin. I don't care if, if you feel like you're uh, God's child right now. The reality is, is, has he purchased you? Has he redeemed you? Okay, then that's it. And, and that is faith that actually leads our feelings. That is faith that makes the dark clouds go away. Because we're like, yeah, I'm having a bad day. I'm having a bad week. Having a bad run here. You know what the good news is? He's redeemed me. He purchased me when I was completely dead in my sin. He still purchased me. I'm still bought. I'm still purified. And then, that, and then that zealous for good works, it stirs back up. Yeah. Yeah, so uh, you, you said something right there. Our faith is not in our feelings, right? It's not in feeling saved. It's not in feeling redeemed, right? There are moments where we feel it, right? I mean, there's times and when... And we like it. And we love it. It's like, oh, could I just stay here forever, right? As youth, youth ministry yeah. for... Oh, on the mountaintop, please. Yeah, 20 years of youth camps in the summer, right? Like you, you, you watch it, like the kids are just sobbing, right? By like day three. And it's like, oh, I love Jesus. I'm never going to not feel this again, right? And <laughs> you don't even get on the bus to go home before they don't feel it, right? So... But you're on that roller coaster when your faith is tied up. The object of your faith is more that feeling that you're chasing. The object of our faith is not a feeling, it's a person. It's the person of Jesus Christ and what he has done. And so the truth of who he is, right? Our feelings have to be informed by that truth, not the other way around. And too often, I think we live letting our feelings dictate reality. I feel this way, so it must be true. And scripture says, no, that's backwards. You're looking at it wrong. Like scripture defines who you are as a child of God. And that needs to inform your feelings to get in line with the truth of who you are. And when it does, yeah, then you get to this place where it's like, yeah, God, use me. 
you know, here's my life. You know, you, do, you can do so much more with it than I could ever do with it in, my, in and of myself. So yes, I am zealous, right, to, to be used by you because I understand who I am. Um, so that's good. It's really, really good. Um, we're going to keep going so that we actually have time to get through this this week and we don't have to make a one-week class three weeks because um, we're, we're kind of tracking there right now. We're going to um, do it. <laughs> we're going to get there. We're going to get done. Um, Colossians 1, verses 18 through 20. And he, that is Christ, is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. Magnificent passage of scripture that talks about the preeminence of Jesus Christ. But what, does, what are we the recipients of because of that? What does this passage tell us? Yeah, we've been reconciled, and we're going to explore that word here in just a few minutes. But so just hold on to your, file that one away for just a few minutes. But yes, we have been reconciled. And what else? How does that passage end? Yeah, he has made peace by the blood of his cross. Um, did we, I think we did this. I need to look back. Yes, we spent two weeks at the very beginning of this course saying to really understand the gospel in all of its rich, riches, you have to understand the holiness of God. How does God feel about sin? He hates it, right? Right? In fact, he talks about how his wrath is poured out on sin. Scripture talks about because God is holy and because we are sinful, Scripture says that before we come to Christ, how does it describe our relationship with God? We're his enemies. Very good, right? But now, because of what Christ has done, we are no longer enemies. We are what? We are reconciled and peace has been made, right? We have peace with God. We are no longer objects of wrath and enemies of God, but now we are reconciled to him and have peace with him because of Christ's work of redemption. That's good news, isn't it? That's really, really good news. One more passage. Do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God? You are not your own. You were bought with a price. So glorify God in your body. What stands out to you in this passage? Yeah. That's redemption, right? He, he spells it out. He kind of takes that, that word redeemed and he says, here's just so you remember, you have been bought with a price, his blood. And because that is true and that has been applied to your life, you have accepted Christ as your savior. His blood has now been applied to you. You have been saved. You have been redeemed. What? Who are you now? What does the beginning of this passage say about you? And what is the gift here? You're a temple of the Holy Spirit. Where? Within you. Yes, sir. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so this, this, this is the gift, right? This, this is what uh, redemption, this is what has been purchased, right? So if you walk through, right, there was forgiveness, there was remove of the curse, there's all of that. But then this, what a great one to end on, right? His spirit 
indwells you. That is also what he has purchased. When he purchased you, when he bought you, he put his spirit inside of you. What's the advantage of that? What's the advantage of that, that he has put his spirit within you? We are a new creation, amen. Okay, there's an ability to walk out in newness of life. What else? What are all the advantages of the Spirit? Amen, right? This, right? this is part of the priesthood of the believer. You don't, have to, you don't have to go through a pastor, right? You're a priesthood of the believer. The Spirit of God is inside of you. What does the Spirit do in you? Yeah, so, it, it, so the, the Spirit enables us to be like Christ, right? To walk out in Christ's likeness. We would say uh, in negative senses, the Spirit convicts us of sin, okay? In positive ways, the Spirit does what? Leads us, gives us spiritual gifts, Right, gives us wisdom, reminds us of God's word. Okay, all of those things, and and as we stated, right, the Spirit is with us. It, like we are a living temple. We don't we don't have to go through anyone else. It's wherever I am right now. The Spirit can convict me. The Spirit can remind me of His word. The Spirit stirs and leaps my heart over these truths. Amen. So John chapter 14 and John chapter 16, Jesus talks about the benefits of the Holy Spirit, the helper that he says will come when he is gone. And he tells his disciples, he says, it's better for you that I go away because if I don't go away, the spirit will not come to indwell you. He says, so like the spirit of Christ within you, the Holy Spirit within you is greater, he says, than even when Jesus was walking in the flesh on the, on the earth. He says, it is better for you because of what the Holy Spirit does in you, the transforming work uh, of, of Christ in your life through the work of the Holy Spirit is a greater benefit and blessing for the life of the believer than even having the physical person of Jesus standing beside you. Isn't that an incredible thought? And then to hear Paul say here that you are that temple of the Holy Spirit, that dwelling place, and all that that then implies about what the Spirit produces in in the life of the believer. And it all comes from the fact that we are redeemed. Could we be the temple of the Holy Spirit if we had not been redeemed? No. Now, remember the, the week, two weeks we spent on atonement? Remember who was here when we talked about atonement? Remember when Pastor Jason walked us through that, that whole process of cleansing the temple that the high priest had to do on that day of Yom Kippur, the day of atonement, right? God would not dwell in an unclean place, right? So the fact that you are the temple of the Holy Spirit means that when God sees you, he sees you through that lens of someone who has been purified, someone who is clean before him. And you can live out of that, that, that standing before him. That's why... I'm that's why in the Old Testament, the Holy Spirit was, was fleeting, would remain on someone for periods of time, but was not permanent dwelling place. But 
what our understanding in the New Testament is, is the Spirit is permanently. It's why you can't lose your salvation, right? Because if, if Christ has cleaned the temple and the Spirit of God dwells within, that's it. It's done. Because it's not, it's not dependent upon me keeping it. It's Christ has already cleaned, right? Do you see, see that movement in Scripture and, and the purpose of what you see in those tutor sessions in the Old Testament and, and then the way they find their, their fulfillment in the New? It's good. So good. Amen. Amen. So good. Okay, so we're going to spend a few minutes with the time we have left thinking about reconciliation. Somebody define what does it mean to be reconciled? To be made right. Okay. What else would you say about reconciliation? brought back together. Okay, so by saying brought back together, that's good because what are you implying? There's, there's, there is a separation, right? Two things that were previously alienated or separated from each other have been brought back together. That's great, right? That is that, is that picture uh, that is so good when we think of the word reconciliation. Yeah, and you've got it on your sheet here, but what we're also assuming is that this is in relationship, right? So there, there's a break in fellowship, in relationship that was severed, broken, it, but, but now has been brought back together. Yeah, so that's, that is good. I'm glad you brought that up because this is, this is an important word for us when we're thinking about the gospel, a lot of the other words we've looked at, they all speak into and reveal the character of God and his heart uh, and what he's doing in this plan of redemption. But some of these are more like, like the word justification. No legal term. Right, it's a legal word. Yeah, it, it's, a, it's, it's an act of God. He declares us righteous because of who he is and what he has done. Right When we think of grace, it is something that it is just this free gift of God that he lavishes upon us to give us what we don't deserve. And his mercy, it's that it's not giving us what we do deserve. Right, So there's these things that it's all God acting and God doing. When we get to this word reconciliation, we understand it's about a relationship, right? It is not just God doing something for us. It's God drawing near, Right? And there's a closeness, there's a fellowship in the gospel in our relationship with him. Isn't that good? Like when you start to understand, this adds another whole dimension to the gospel when we think we've not just been declared righteous, but we've actually been reconciled. We were previously, we said this earlier, we were enemies with God. We were the objects of wrath. We were dead in our sin, separated from him. But, yes, sir. Does that also mean uh, to repent? Would that be part of that? Repentance? To repent? Ab absolutely, yeah. To be reconciled with God, we must repent of our sin. Um, that word repent is, it's a military word, and it means about face, right? It's this idea, I was headed in this direction, and I have repented, I have turned, and I am now going 180 degrees in the opposite direction, right? And repentance is necessary for reconciliation, absolutely. Right? We said that a couple weeks ago, uh, that what is required for salvation. Yeah, but your, your point here is good. Like there, there, is, there is one way where you could just view that, oh, that's a military term. I was walking this way and then I turned and now I'm walking that way. But what this word reconciliation ties into uh, that you need to go back and apply to all the previous language is the relationship component, right? So 
when we repent, it leads towards reconciliation. So yes, I was walking this way, and, I, and now I'm turned and walking this way. But reconciliation forces you to also insert the idea, I'm walking towards a person, right? Towards God. Uh, we are reconciled in relationship. So you, you piece all these together, and it, it just it adds more flavor. So you can go back, and, and you can hear words like, okay, uh, redemption. He has purchased you. And, and then you, you take a look at that focus, like he's purchased you to himself to reconcile, to fix the relationship. So, so it just adds that, that layer that provides uh, a depth and a why. So yes, you've been declared legally righteous. You've been clothed in the righteousness of Christ. Why? So that he can draw you. Yeah, for a relationship. For a relationship. Him, right? I love that. Yeah, you are, you are walking towards someone, right? <laughs> but he has pursued you. Right? That's, that's the beauty of, of the gospel, that he, he has pursued you. He has reconciled you to himself. You have not done it. He has done it. Mm-hmm. Right? Even <laughs> scripture would even tell us the ability to repent of our sin comes from him. It is the gift of God to, for us to even have the ability to repent of our sin so that reconciliation is possible. It's all him. It's all him. It's all him. All right. So we're going to do something fun here for a couple of minutes. I want to see how close you can get with some fill in the blanks here. Okay. I'm not just going to give them to you. That wouldn't be any fun. I want you to try to help me and see what words would fit in some of these blanks. All right. So we're going to go one at a time here and we're going to walk through this. We need reconciliation with God because our relationship with him was what? Oh my goodness, look at that. You're one for one. Our relationship with him, the rest is not as easy. <laughs> well, as we go along, I think, I think it'll come into focus here. All right? Two things about God. Yeah, this one, you could, fill in, you could fill these blanks in with a lot of things. I'll give you that. But as we think through this, we need reconciliation with God because our relationship with him was broken. God is... What and oh, what? I heard one word. What was that? And what else would you put? That's good. Oh, there we go. We'll put them together. Holy and righteous, right? If we're broken and sinful, God is holy and righteous. And what does our sin do? Our sin, what? Separates us from him. You guys are doing good. All right. Now, sin made us his what? Look at that. Made us his enemies. On the cross, though, Jesus took our sin upon himself, and and he did what with God's justice? Yes. He's uh, satisfying, or he satisfied God's justice when he took our sin upon himself. Jesus' death made it possible for us to have, oh, I hear different words. That's good. Fellowship was a good word. That is a good word. It's a good word. We saw this in uh, Colossians 1, 18 and 20. One of the things that peace, very good. Fellowship was a good word. Peace is a good word here, right? Jesus' death made it possible for us to have peace with God. Just like 2 Corinthians 5, 19 says, if you had that open, you would know this next blank. God was what? To To himself. Blank the world to himself. Yes. Yes. Very good. He was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against them. Now we can be called God's what? All, both of those are true, yes and yes. But according to John 15, 15, what word would go here? Look, look at the next thing. Jesus' brothers and sisters. What else are we called? 
All of those are correct. All these are good. There's so many things you could put here. But the answer we were looking for, according to John 15, 15, is friend. <laughs> That's good. We can be called God's friends and Jesus' brothers and sisters. Remember, we saw this last week when we looked at that idea of a redeemer uh, and the qualifications of a kinsman redeemer. So we saw that then. Those who have been through faith, saved is a good word. Oh, there it was. I heard it. Justified through faith. Was that you, Paul? Yes. My goodness. Look at you. That's better. Now, now it feels better. Okay. <laughs> Those who have been justified through faith by Jesus is what? Through his blood. That's right through his death, through his sacrifice, yes, through his blood, no longer have their sins counted against them. They are, ah, oh, very good, reconciled to God. Well done. You guys did it. Good job. Give yourselves a hand. That was pretty good. You actually got that very quick. And some of those, there's lots we could have put in those blanks, but isn't that an incredible statement? When you think about that, after we felt that we were focused on filling in the words, but now reading it in its entirety, look at that. We were separated. We were broken. But God has now, the demands of a holy God have been satisfied in Jesus. We now have peace. We're now reconciled. We're now called his friends. We have been justified by his blood. Amen and amen, right? So one passage no longer his enemies. I lost you there. I heard noise in the kitchen. What was that, Judge? God gave us the water. That's right. <laughs> that's right. He, that's right. We are not his enemies. We are his friends. He has given us that drink from his living water, right? All right. So I want us to spend a couple of minutes here. You've got it in front of you on the next page. A passage in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, heading in your Bible might say the ministry of reconciliation. This is a great passage for us to kind of just look at. I want you to look here at these first verses here in 11 through 13. Look at where um, the posture that Paul is talking about, this idea about um, where, where focus should be. He says, therefore, knowing the fear of the Lord, we persuade others. But what we are is known to God, and I hope it is known also to your conscience. We are not commending ourselves to you again, but we're giving you cause to boast about us so that you may be able to answer those who boast about outward appearance and not about what is in the heart. For if we are beside ourselves, it is for God. If we are in our right mind, it is for you. Paul's addressing here in this text, people who were accusing him of being out of his mind and crazy, right? There were these other guys that were more flashy, more polished, right? And they were coming in and they were just trying to discredit Paul's message. And so here he is talking to them and he says, listen, right? Everything we are doing, our focus Right? We are grounded in just this, this fear, this awe, this reverence for God. And we belong to him. We are his. Everything about us, everything good about us comes from him. Right? If, if, if people want to call us crazy, let them call us crazy because it is not about us. It is about him. Right? That's where Paul's focus is in this text. And then he goes on in the next couple of verses. And I want you to see this. He says, for the love of Christ controls us. Because we have concluded this, that one has died for all, therefore all have died, and he died for all. That's a lot of alls in just a few words there, isn't it? But think about this for a minute, right? This idea that one has died for all, right? So this all is talking about just the scope who is salvation available for? All, 
right? In that aspect, yes, the scope of redemption and reconciliation with God is available to all. But the next all, right? Therefore, all have died. Who is this all speaking of? Us, right? Those who have applied the blood of Christ to their hearts, who have been cleansed because we have died to ourselves. We are now a new creation, right? We have been crucified with Christ. Therefore, we no longer live, but Christ lives through us, right? So this all here has changed. This is those who have now, the scope of reconciliation and redemption has now been applied and appropriated to the lives of those who have received it. They have died and he died for all that those who live might no longer live for themselves, but for him who for their sake died and was raised. Do you see the change in perspective here in what we're living for as those who have been redeemed and reconciled to God? Who are we now living for? Yeah, who is living through us? Is it us that's living now? No, it's Christ in us that is living, right? That is, that is the power of, of what we're looking at here, that we've been redeemed and reconciled. It's no longer us. It is Christ living through us that, that we have life. And he goes on to explain what that looks like in this next passage. From now on, therefore, we regard no one according to the flesh, even though we once regarded Christ according to the flesh, we regard him thus no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away, the new, behold, the new has come. All right, we've been talking about this all night, about what, what is the power of redemption? What is the power of reconciliation? Right, it's the fact that we are a new creation. Who we were before is no longer, right? It is now Christ um, who is, we are brand new. We are made new in him, right? That's, that's what it means. That, that's, that's reconciliation. That's what it means that we have been reconciled to God is that he has made us new. Uh, here in a few weeks, when we look at glorification, we're going to look at how God's rescue and redemption story kind of comes to <laughs> the culmination when Revelation talks about how he makes all things new. Amen? But because this is true of us, the way Paul concludes this thought in the rest of chapter 5 is to say, now what should we be doing as those who have been reconciled? He says, everything that we have, this gift of salvation is from God, who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. Skip down to verse 20. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ, God making his appeal through us. We implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. For our sake, he made him to be sin who knew no sin so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. What is it we are called to do? Yeah. Yeah, to be an ambassador for Jesus Christ. What does an ambassador do? Represent? Yeah. Yeah. An ambassador does not speak on his own behalf, does he? Or does she? An ambassador speaks on behalf of the one who sent them. They speak the words of the one who sent them, right? They represent someone else. So as an ambassador for Jesus Christ, we represent him in this world. And so if we if what's true of us is we are redeemed and reconciled to God, and now we are his ambassadors, what is the message we are to be proclaiming to the world? That they can be what? Redeemed and be, yeah, that they can be reconciled to God. 
Amen? Like that is the message that we are to proclaim as his ambassadors. But I want you to consider another powerful truth here because he has given us, as as Paul's telling us here, this ministry of reconciliation as believers, right? Should, Should we not be careful and diligent to reflect this ministry of reconciliation that we've been reconciled to God, even though we were enemies with him before, should we not reflect that in our personal relationships with one another? Yeah, I think that's, that's the thrust of what Paul is saying here is, hey, your vertical restoration, your restoration and reconciliation with God has been taken care of. You don't have to worry about that. So where you can focus is on reconciliation horizontally with other people, that God can use you. One, to, to shine the gospel, to shine the light of Jesus to those who need vertical reconciliation. But one of the ways we show the power of that is by the way that we relate to people around us. And that what Christ tells his disciples, they, were, they will know that you are mine by what? By the way you love one another, right? By the way you live in peace and, and, and harmony and, uh, and if it's possible with you, right? As far as it's possible with you, live at peace with one another, right? Reconciliation requires two parties, but, but the press here of this passage is that is that, hey, we know the truth that because we have been reconciled to God, we can extend that to someone else. We can make peace. We can be quick to forgive. We can be quick to work toward, toward restored relationships with one another. And in doing so, we are reflecting the gospel. We're preaching the gospel uh, to those around us. Uh, But to have that rooted in the fact of, hey, this is what's true of you positionally, right? And it's out of that truth that we can then interact with one another is, it's a game changer for for our lives, is it not? Anything you want to add? I know we're, we just barely did it. We did it. We got all the way through. Congratulations. We don't have to do this in three. That's right. We can, we can be done. Note to self, don't try to wrap those two things up in one. All right, guys. So next week when we come back, um, we're going to spend one week on sanctification now. Your whole table of contents, course overview is all just out of whack now. So if things like that bug you, you're just going to want to rip that page out and throw it away of your notebook. <laughs> Because um, we're going to do one week on sanctification to kind of get ourselves back on track to finish. Uh, so when we come back, that's what we're going to explore. Is what does it mean that we are being sanctified? Uh, we'll talk about that next week. All right. Have a great night, guys. Yeah. God bless you. <laughs>